on mute and videos off. And if anyone has a question, please click on the raise hand icon and we will get to your questions at the end of our discussion. If you are having any technical difficulties, please indicate such in the chat and we will look to get you serviced. Um, so Eric is president and CEO of Stella Jones, which he was appointed to the position in 2019. He joined the company in 2007. And prior to that, he had, ex as had experience as a corporate controller of mega brands and previously had uh, pharmaceutical experience. Um, and he has a strong uh, accounting background as he was the former CFO of Stella Jones. Um, so just as a brief introduction, I know the people who are registered are all very familiar with the company, but as a refresher, Stella is a manufacturer and supplier of pressure treated wood products. They've historically been known for their railway ties and then picked up steam on the utility pole segment. They now have five verticals, including residential lumber, which had very strong record performance throughout 2020 and drove, you know, kind of record high financial performance. So Eric, thank you for being with us today. We're very happy to have you and uh, we'll just, do you want to get right into it? Yes, let's, let's do it. Okay, perfect. Um, so Eric, I remember speaking to you uh, just over a year ago. Uh, it was March 2020. It was very trying times. Everyone was trying to figure out what the net COVID impact would be to operations. And there was new information coming out daily and a lot of uncertainty is how I would characterize it. How would you describe those first few weeks and months when we went into that initial state of emergency? And what words would you use to characterize the state of the business currently? Well, the, um, you know, the first challenge was uh, you know, essentially putting in place uh, proper and new policies to, uh, to protect our employees and to mitigate COVID-19 um, spread. Um, we're also very fortunate, you know, to be um, suppliers to um, customers that uh, were deemed uh, as essential, you know, to North American economy being the rails, the utilities and the, the, the construction business. So once we got that part down, uh, you know, we were very fortunate, as I said, to remain, have all our uh, 40 treating facilities open, uh, you know, for the whole year last year throughout the, throughout the pandemic. Um, then it was the challenge, I guess, uh, for us to be able to properly understand what the, the dynamics were going to be in, in our product categories. Um, we already had insight with uh, our, our class one customers who had indicated that they would hold their maintenance programs. And uh, we, we had a very good sense our early in the second quarter of last year that we would have strong demand. Traffics were already a, a bit low on the rail networks and a few class ones had indicated wanted to accelerate. So we were felt you know, comfortable with, with the, the, the class one piece. We we thought on the onset that utility poles would follow as well in the same pattern, holding their uh, their maintenance programs. Uh, learned, you know, as things progressed, that um, certain utilities took pre better precautions or greater precautions to protect their own employees. So maintenance slightly slowed down, uh, you know, throughout the year. Uh, we did have great sales last year in the uh, in the utility pole product category, but uh, this the slower this, the slower maintenance on the volume. So I got compensated by emergency response, you know, with regards to wildfires and, and windstorms last year. And um, as well, uh, the introduction of our um, um, wrapped utility pole, uh, the, the wrap being a fire resistant product, which also gave us, you know, good traction with our, our California customers. The, the greatest unknown that was really the, the residential lumber piece. And it, it's, it's about a year ago, actually, that uh, stores in Ontario shut down for the entire month of April. And I can remember spending uh, several days with our residential lumber team trying to figure out scenarios as, you know, is it going to be up? Is it going to be down? And I guess we, we, uh, we were very fortunate that our key customers supplied us with, you know, day-to-day -day information. So as stores were shut down, uh, homeowners, wishing to do renovation projects actually turned to the web to order lumber, which was not uh, something of habit, uh, you know, in the, in the past years, uh, curbside deliveries uh, and, or, you know, outdoor store pickups became, became a big thing. And it, it took us, you know, about a week to understand that there was still going to be a very strong market. And that actually helped us remain 
uh, you know, active with the sawmills. We did not cancel any purchase orders and we kept ordering. Uh, and then, you know, and then in subsequent questions, I think we're going to explore a bit more the residential lumber theme. But, you know, with regards to that product category, the customers were, were really key to help us understand the, the those dynamics. You know, and I think the last part of your question was, uh, you know, how do I correct, ca characterize, you know, today? You know, I think now we're a year into this. I think our industries have uh, figured out how to function, you know, in this uh, in this context. Uh, still, you know, COVID is present. There's some headwinds for sure, but I think you know, there's uh, everybody's a adapting, and you know, it's uh, it's it's now part of uh, it's now part of uh, everybody's life and maintenance programs. But you know, utilities and, and railroads acknowledge that they need to execute with their programs, and you know, we're 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 looking at a very exciting year on residential lumber as well. So it's uh, still interesting times, but uh, definitely uh, you know a bit more we're a bit more accustomed as to what what, what to expect. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> and you did uh, kind of lead in, good, uh, give a good segue into the next line of questioning, which is the residential side of things. Um, did you ever envision that a year a year ago that residential would have had the performance that I did? Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak to how you know the company was well positioned to capitalize on that increased demand, particularly versus peers, and how has your relationship with the end market customers evolved? Um, you know, and the mix of customers is it the same? Are you moving into different new geographies? And um, I understand that you are optimistic about continued growth for this segment for for this year. But just if we could delve into residential lumber a little bit, that'd be great. Thank oh, you. Definitely, yeah. So as I mentioned, we you know what. We, uh, previously predicted one of the key items was you know understanding what the market was going to do um and when i talk about not falling out of sequence with sawmills that that's important because once you fall out it, it's kind of difficult to get back in you know if you're if you're if i think about a year ago if you don't order any lumber you know for the month of may for delivery in june and you go back to a sawmill in june you won't get a deliver until August. So you sort of fall out of the sequence, which we did not do. So that was a great advantage, you know, we had. So that resulted in us being able to have inventory, which was very important because demand was the demand was very strong throughout the entire summer, but also have the proper mix of products. And, and that's also important. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you want to do a fencing project, for example, if the store doesn't have fence posts, you know, you won't sell the fence boards. So yeah. you need the right mix. And last year, fence post was a big deal as pe people, homeowners wanted to build fences. Uh, so we were in a great position since we kept in tune with sawmills and remanufacturers that kept us, that kept us supplied, you know, we were able to supply customers. Now, that being said, we could not procure enough to, to, to keep up with the demand. Uh, and it, it was true for the entire industry. Uh, but I do believe and I'm convinced that we serviced our customers better than, than the competition. Um, we do have certain customers that are shared between us and other treaters in the industry and other uh, customers that are exclusive. So we do have a bit of insight on how well we did last year. So to, you know, to, you know, one of your, one part of your question was like, you know, how did that play for us? Well, you know, that definitely got us a greater part of the 2021 program, you know, as the, through October, November, with customers, we negotiate and discuss like what volume we can supply and so on. Uh, we definitely uh, found an appetite with uh, several of our actual customers wanting to do more business with us. So that, that was great. It created two, two problems, I guess. One is that we ended the season last year with low inventory. So we had to figure out a way to replenish inventory at a fast pace. And we all saw that in our Q4 results where we invested in working cap and we continued to do so in the first quarter of this year. And secondly, we had to adjust uh, capacity. So we did adjust um, using our current capacity. So adding, you know, extending some shifts and, you know, uh, we're working weekends and so on. We did also invest some CapEx to be able to, you know, to process wood faster at a better pace throughout our, our facility. So definitely this good throughput helps us also, you know, uh, on the efficiency side, but also on the economics of our business. Okay, no, that's, that's great. Now, when you were talking about we couldn't necessarily keep up with demand. Do you have any, you know, could that be quantified or tracked that you had, you could fulfill, you know, 80% of the requests that were out there and that was, you know, ahead of the peers, 60%, is that quantifiable at all? It's difficult because we don't know what that end demand number was. Um, okay. Uh, you know, but, but a lot of signs of, you know, but, you know, all, 
the, the stores were actually selling, like, you know, if you deliver a full truck of pressure treated wood on a, on, a, on a Monday morning by noon and it was sold, like contractors were just, you know, grabbing the inventory as fast as they could. Contractors themselves could not keep up. I mean, in, in September, contractors were reporting for Q1 and Q2 of 2021. Uh, so that's how, you know, our customers got a good sense of what 2021 could look like, but so did we as, you know, we, we have relationships with a, a, lot, of cust- a lot of contractors at the, at the store level. So that's how we got a bit of a sense of, you know, what, what uh, was ahead of us. No, and that, that's really good insight because even, you know, when you're saying that you, you the shipment came in and then by noon, noon it was sold out. I mean, even as an analyst looking, covering the name, you know, we were thinking how much re- growth in the residential side could you have, you know, and, you know, very simplistically, like how many new decks and patios and, um, yep. you know, sheds are going to go in, but there was just this pent up demand that was never really fulfilled for even, you know, orders going out six months plus. So that's just, you know, helpful to have that context. Well, then to your point about, you know, sheds and decks, if, you know, I think, the theme, I don't know if it was a coincidence, but you know, in the last few weeks, I've heard about two or three times that you can't find a pool for this, this coming season, right? Everything's been sold out. So already, again, if you have a pool, you need fences and you need decks. It, it's just complimentary. So those are things that you know, we sort of take a look at and try to understand because it sort of you know, communicates a bit, a bit like or what our belief is and not only the demand we're seeing when the complimentary products are, are also in demand and you know, it, it makes for a stronger story. No, and that's good. Yeah, good insight. And just, you know, statistically, I think just in Canada, they have uh, the latest statistic was by the end of September, 75% of adult Canadians will be vaccinated. So it looks like we're still going to be in this work from home environment, um, heading into the summer with limited travel and limited outside activities. So it definitely makes sense for that. Yeah. And then again, if there's no, you know, de- depending on the different variants and how long these vaccines can impact or target against them, you know, it could extend the period um, which we're homebound. Um, so now I just wanted to move a little bit more onto. The growth side of things. And if we look back to Stella's history, growth uh, through 2000s up to 2018, even characterized by strong annual double digit increases, that the kegger was over 10% top line growth. And I think the growth during that period was unique. It was, you know, a combination of uh, a number of factors. So gaining market share from competitors, continued M&A activity. Um, you know, once you would take on these acquisitions, it was increasing the utilization there, um, extracting synergies. I know that over the last couple of years, growth has tapered off some due to a number of, of reasons. I mean, 2020 was phenomenal because of residential. Um, but just thinking about the future, what do you think are sustainable levels of growth for the company on a go forward basis? I know you talk um, and we've discussed even using GDP as a proxy, but how could we think about building on that? Oh, we'll take it product category by product category. They each have their own dynamics. So utility poles, we've uh, we've seen volume increases and and pricing as well for the last several years. And we've been always been talking about a you know mid to high uh, single digit, digit growth, and that that's driven uh, by maintenance requirements. Uh, we have a lot of customers that have started or initiated some some enhanced repl- replacement or hardening of the grids mm-hmm. uh, maybe now for fire fire retarding or fire hardening of their grids and or just you know for for the the, the resiliency of their uh, of, of their networks um, we're, we're also seeing you know year over year as contracts come out to bid you know we're also having some success in, in market in, in extending our reach uh, to to new customers, so that 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 is always a uh, always a great positive. Over and above that, in that product category, there's certain trends that you know are worth mentioning. One is uh, the the five G infrastructure being uh, developed in North America, where we are seeing some demand for poles for you know for installation of, of different hardwares and repeater stations for uh, for cell communications. Um, there are projects that have been projects in the last few years in Canada, but now we're seeing them as well in the U.S. to bring uh, broadband or internet to uh, rural regions. So obviously that will, you know, re- requires uh, re- requires some 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 infrastructure with regards to that. Um, we spoke about the fire retardant as well. That, that I think that is something that we haven't seen the full potential yet. Um, uh, 
probably but this year, 2021 or 2022, but then that would be actually sustainable uh, as it'll be part of the, 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 the maintenance re replacement. On the railway tire front, um, you know, I think that's where the GDP applies the best. Um, we, we, we had um, good growth last year, actually, in, in, a, in a market that was actually flattish as an industry. Year over year, we actually had a 5% growth, which, you know, was, uh, was great. Um, that was driven in part by class ones actually coming to Stella Jones for more volumes. Um, and that is more part of their annual maintenance. So uh, our conclusion was that the competition actually couldn't either could not supply or had some sort of concern or did not want to supply the volumes, but we definitely benefited from that, which is great. We continue to innovate as well in that product category and uh, attract attention of our customers. Um, obviously, our, our, our logistics strength is, is great. We have you know, distribution yards. We, um, we actually rail, lease rail cars to offer them up to, to our, our rail customers as um, more and more class ones are putting certain cars out of service, especially the ones that he used for these, what I'll call internal moves as they're moving you know, their own material. They don't use the, the best cars they have, so they tend to retire them and not replace them. So those are all things that we try to do with our customers to, you know, in, enhance our presence and be part of, of be part of the solution. Um, you know, when you think about ties and poles, uh, the uh, U.S. administration is now looking at a big, big infrastructure bill, uh, mm -hmm. and that would definitely uh, benefit ties and poles for for several years. Uh, and if you take some time to read through the different summaries, you know, there's different mentions about, you know, tr transit replacement or enhancements of, of networks and, uh, and, and actually broadband and broadband expansion and, and so on and so forth. So I, I think there's some, some great opportunities there, you know, over time. Um, the residential number part, well, um, you know, we're still living great dynamics. Uh, you know, we're still, you know, in 2022, we still have high um, high lumber prices, which which is helping us, you know, su su sustain that high level of uh, uh, of sales. I think that you know we might see that subside eventually in time, and you know, fair enough. But I think out of this, once you know we the dust has settled, if I use 2019 as a benchmark, we'll find ourselves with a greater uh, market presence in in Canada with greater volumes with certain customers that are now working with us. More in, the, more in the partnership aspect of things. Uh, you know, so there was one bigger customer, one big box that we did have the great partnership with as far as you know, using our, our, our plants as distribution networks and giving them benefit of distribution agreements that we have for composite decking, for example. We're bringing this to other customers now. So we're sort of tying them in to the Stella Jones approach process, if you want, and trying not to come out, commoditize the product as much. So coming out of it, I think we'll be strong in residential lumber as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, and then I guess I'll just turn to end markets and key customers. Um, you know, you touched on the railway side of things, um, you know, the CapEx budgets of the class ones, and you are a supplier to all of the class ones. And even on our side, we tend to try to track the, the budgets and gauge if declines could impact you. Uh, we do know that railway maintenance is a small percentage of the overall budget, but there is, a, I would say, high level of commitment uh, to safety in maintaining the network that we've seen even within the press releases. When I first saw the news of CP in Kansas City, I thought, wow, I can't believe they're merging <laughs> the industry so small. Um, but then I was thinking about the potential impacts to you down the line. And you know, you have been a major supplier for CP and I know you supply into Kansas City. What was your first thought when you heard of the transaction? How do you think it could change the business if at all? And does this flow through to you or any suppliers? So we, we are a, uh, a significant supplier to the Canadian Pacific, and we do have several plans that are online with them. So my first reaction was, you know, this, this could be positive for us, you know, um, in, in the sh mid, mid, short to midterm, if you want, simply because the two mm. railroads need to connect. They, mm. they need to expand to some, to some extent to be able to adjust. So I think we would, we would definitely benefit from that. Mm. Um, we, we are a supplier to the, the, the KCS, so we do a, a lot of their, their bridge requirements. We do sell a bit of railway ties to them, but uh, maybe for the audience, remind them all that the, the KCS is the last uh, uh, class one to actually own their own treating facility. Um, and I believe that perhaps under uh, uh, a new management, they, you know, 
CP might view those assets as non-core, uh, and we'd be very well positioned. I mean, we are the we're the only company that has actually a trading plan online with them. Uh, so I think we'd be well positioned to service them, and we'd be uh, ready and happy to take those assets off of their hands if that, that would. that you have had it in mind so it's nice to hear you guys explicitly state that and yeah. thank you for sharing for the audience thanks My pleasure um and so um we kind of went into a little bit the COVID stuff so now i'm just going to go since since we are on that note for m a acquisition strategy has been significant um you know looking back over the last you know 15 20 years you've made one two three acquisitions a year that have varied from um you know and purchase price and revenue is quite similar here it's almost on a 0.9 times basis it's the math that i was doing but um you know anywhere from 50 million to 100 million in purchase price per year what can we expect from acquisition strategy going forward you know where are the low-hanging fruits we just discussed um, if there was a potential for uh, Kansas City to divest their tie, uh, their tie plant, um, but is it ties, poles, residential lumber? It's, you know, you've been seeing a lot of organic growth there. Um, is there anything to do uh, in different geographies? I know there was uh, the first acquisition that you made, um, I think it was, oh, 20, I can't remember the year, 2015, that company in Ontario, and then- Ram Forest um, Products, yeah. Yeah, Ram Forest Products. And then you also did the Winnipeg acquisition on the residential side. Yep. Um, so just, you know, are you waiting for the dust to settle from COVID before pulling the trigger? Do you have a pipeline of targets at this point? Um, what kind of growth can we expect from M&A and just the verticals? Sorry, I know that was a lot. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's all good. <laughs> so, I mean, the this talent drones management team has always had, you know, I guess a short list of, of, of targets. Uh, and most of these companies are family owned and they're families that we know and have ongoing discussions with. Um, you know, we're we're sizing that in our three core product categories right now, or you know, probably additional sales between 300 and 400 million US dollars. Um, I'd say that the first six months of COVID last year sort of, you know, turned everybody's mind away from m a especially in, in with, you know, the, the families or the targets we're discussing as everybody was trying to focus on their business and see how we're going to navigate through this. Um, end of Q3 or Q4, you know, as everybody's getting comfortable, we reinitiated discussions with, with a few targets and we're still discussing with them. Um, Discussions are progressing at different rate depending on who we're talking to, um, but you know it, it's still something that you know we we definitely feel that it's part of um, of our strategy. There are certain targets that would be great additions to our current network, very complementary, and give us access, you know, to, to further ingrain ourselves, you know, in, in certain regions in in North America. Majority would be poles, uh, but to your point, there's there there is some some ideas on, on the railway tie side uh, on, on the horizon. So we're we're quite uh, excited about that, and I think we're we're probably the right partner to be discussing with with regards to that. On the the residential lumber front, um, so the the expansion we we took in Canada was really to position ourselves to be able to address a coast to coast approach as a national provider in a market that. And again, market meaning the Canadian market that functions really more on a partnership basis and less of a pricing commodity and trying to squeeze the suppliers. The, 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 the customers we work with are, are very much about how can you support our business. And a very good example was, you know, um, Q4 of this year with the high lumber prices. We had very good discussions with our customers about, look, we're going to go out and buy this lumber at these high prices. We don't know what 2021 is going to look like. But if we're going to go in and commit, don't expect us to drop prices uh, as fast as a market could fall, if a market would fall. And, you know, the reaction was, we see a strong year. 
go and buy everything you can. We'll work with you if, 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 if something happens. We're fortunate right now. Obviously, prices are holding. But even if prices were to drop tomorrow, we know that our customers will work with us as our cost of inventory averages down. We would work our prices that way and not follow, for example, random, random lengths price decline. So, so that, that's, that's very unique and, um, and, and, and very important for us. So that being said, outside of Canada, and mainly if you think about the US where we have a much smaller presence, right? So 70% of our sales for residential lumber in Canada, the US market is a bit more price driven, a lot of formulas driven off of random lengths and, and pretty much more commoditized, um, you know, bigger players in the industry, um, you know, yield much lower if it done margins, you know, that's, that's our impression or our read on it. Um, so I think it, it's a decision um, that we're not willing to take right now because I think it would really change the profile. You know, we'd become more of a building materials company than a wood uh, industrial infrastructure business, which is still 70% mm -hmm. of our sales. And I think it's a steady stream. And I think, you know, we, we deserve a better multiple than the, the building materials business because of, you know, of, of that profile. Okay, no, that's very insightful and helpful for us to think about the M&A trajectory, so thank you. Um, I do wanna just delve a little bit deeper. You touched on uh, the partnership structure that you have in Canada, those relationships that you have with the customers, even talking about on the residential lumber side, the elevated or escalated price environment, and you going to the customers and saying, you know, we don't wanna take a hit on this, and then saying, go out and buy everything you can. Um, there are massive ebbs and flows, right, in the in the pricing structure, and and one I would say unique, um, you know, for an, 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 an as an investment point of view, at the end of the day, your margin profile is relatively stable. I mean, there are ebbs and flows, um, but you do pass those on. <clears throat> so, just as an example, you're buying inventory at rich prices, prices come down. There is some near-term potential for margin erosion, but at some point, and then on the, other, the flip side of it, the margin can ex expansion can occur, but then you do go back to customers, put through pricing increases or vice versa if you need to. Can you just talk a little bit more about that dynamic and how it flushes out? So, I mean, it is true for all product categories, uh, you know, so quick reminder on, on ties and poles, you know, we do have pass throughs on fiber cost, which is, uh, you know, a, a great feature to have simply because, you know, when, when there are certain spikes or, or, or drops in, in, in market prices, you know, we get a chance to, to, to work with our customers and preserve the, the, the margin profile to your point. Um, and, and it's, and it's also true for the residential lumber on the majority, which is the Canadian piece, where you know, as as you well, as, as you pointed out, and I explained the, uh, just a few minutes ago, that uh, you know our, our commitment in, in Q4 and Q1 of a year, uh, you know, first we have to accumulate inventory, uh, obviously, because right now we, our, our our two biggest months of uh, in sales of the year would be May and June. So, and there's no way that we could you know procure and treat. Uh, for, the, for the volumes of those two specific months within those months. So we need to accumulate some, some finished good inventories, but we're also committing with three manufacturers like fence boards, for example, or two by six, uh, two by six pieces of wood that, that are split in two. So someone needs to buy the wood, we need to bring it to remanufacturing sites to get it cut. So those are get, get done real early in the year. So our customers know that, you know, if they want for, to back to my example, the fences, you know, it needs to be planned out ahead of time. So uh, the, 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 the commitment for a bigger part of the 2021 season gets done really earlier on. Um, but the, the, the relationship as you're pointing out with our customers is that, well, we know that you guys are, are going out there to support the program because uh, at the end of the day, you know, we're ensuring that that lumber flows through the, the different distribution channels and gets to the, to, to the end customer. That's why we also do like uh, direct to home deliveries and we have reps in the stores to make sure that inventory is well managed and, 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 moves, uh, and moves forward. But the, at the end of the day, our customers are sophisticated enough to understand the markets. If the markets, the, the soft wood lumber markets does trend downwards, they will expect us eventually to, to, to adjust our pricing, but then we'll come up with a strategy to say, well, here's my average cost today. And if I keep buying, a, you know, if, if I could use my hands, you know, if it drops, if something drops like this, we'll probably have, you know, a declining pricing, which would be, you know, on, on a smoother, um, on, on, a, on a smoother trend, just because, you know, we need to turn over our, our inventory. 
Okay, no, that was helpful. See, virtual times, you're resorting to all sorts of tactics to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to tell members in the audience, don't be shy with questioning. This is an interactive discussion. I'm excited by it and I want you to get in on the action as well with your questions. Um, also in the virtual briefcase to the right for the attendees, there is the presentation and slide deck for Stella Jones if you did wanna flip through that while we are discussing. Um, so just now moving into end market indicators and we're all trying to track ahead of time how you're going to do, um, you know, there's railway tie data, inventory levels, uh, CapEx budgets, um, you know, Home Depot, even guidance, estimates, weather to some degree. I remember one year uh, it was too wet and that impacted harvesting. Um, what are indicators that you track on your side, if at all, or would be useful? for the investment community to look to as just some sort of gauge or proxy to how the end markets are doing. All right. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned a few important ones, obviously. Um, on the lumber side, looking at random lengths and uh, futures on lumber, you know, would give us a, a bit of a sense of where general markets are going, housing starts. Yes. Um, you know, th those are always uh, interesting uh, in indicators. Um, rail traffic statistics um, would probably give us a bit of a future read, um, you know, so the, the, the class ones, to your point at the RTA, the class ones every year, you know, sort of disclose their annual program. So we know today what the class ones are going to maintain and, you know, it, it doesn't change that drastically uh, in Wednesday, Wednesday announced the program, but seeing increased traffic on the rail networks is, is, uh, is important for two factors. One, there's more usage of the rail, therefore should be more maintenance. Mm. Two also would indicate higher revenues, which would be a greater allocation of, uh, of that proportion of revenues that goes to CapEx of which we would benefit from. So those are things we follow, but most importantly, and I guess it's not something that people could, tr could track, but really it's, you know, a lot of source of information comes by discussions with our customers um, and customers at the procurement, but also on, on the engineering side. Yeah, the, you know, three years ago, we heard our engineering departments at Southern Calidus and talking about, we need to fire harden our grid. And at that point, you know, one could think that, well, wood burns. So, you know, we're, we're gonna be shown the, the, the way out, but, you know, listening to them and just being a bit more innovative and thinking about how we can address it, we actually demonstrated that wood was a better product and wood with the fire wrap was, was even better. So a lot of intelligence comes from constant communications with our customers and our presence, uh, you know, at their facilities, but also talking to different departments to understand what the internal trends are and where they're going with their businesses. And how often are you talking to some of your customers, your major customers? Is it, you know, quarterly, annually? So I mean, just to give the, uh, you know, sense for the audience. Well, so it's, it's depending on, who you're dealing with at a railroad or utility, some of it is weekly because obviously you have shipments every day yeah. and you need to make sure you're following the projects. There are weekly calls with uh, a lot of our plants. Uh, you know, like for, in, we have a plant in Kentucky that services the CN. There's a weekly call of when your cars are gonna come in, how are you gonna load them, when are you gonna be ready? When do we bring the locomotive back in? Um, we meet with procurement at least twice a quarter, uh, well, if we could face to face. So mm. the, the people that are more in, in charge of the strategy, they you know, get the requirements from engineering if you want and, you know, sort of figure out what, what the procurement profile would be. Um, then there's top to top meetings that will occur like, you know, maybe once a year where, I'll, you know, I'll have an opportunity to talk with a CEO or a senior leader at our customers and, you know, discuss about business and trends and see how we could service them better and try to, you know, give them a chance to explain to them how we could, you know, be, be better suppliers to them. I know it's good. I'm still learning. Like every time I talk to you, I learn something new. So it's good to keep asking these type of questions. And just also, um, I think it's just nice for the audience. How long does a poll last and how long does a tie last? Hmm. So, you know, I guess that's our, our, our views on it. We, yes. I, I would say a utility poll would have a, a lifespan of maybe 65 years, more or less. You could extend it long, you know, longer in time, but it, it also could be short. But I think 65 years is, is a good uh, you know, a, a good estimate to use. Railway ties, that'll vary depending on the, the, the type of line. So like in main line that gets a lot of usage with heavy, uh, heavy freight trains, you know, I would probably say something like 30 years, uh, but, you know, a, a secondary line in an in industrial, uh, industrial park, I would say could, could last 50 years because there's, there's not a lot of, uh, 
wear and tear on, on that railway ties because you know uh, the railway ties is, is really the shock absorber if you want between the steel rail and the, the 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 ballast the bedrock that's under it so obviously when you've got lots of heavy train going on that tie there's lots of pounding usually you'll change out a tie not because it's rotting you or it's 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 more because there's there's it's 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 getting mechanically damaged because of, of the usage versus the pole you would change it end of life because you know at one point we would because a bit more brittle okay now that's good i remember a couple of years ago i did a just trying to dig into how old the utility poles were in North America. And I ended up calling, I wasn't covering any utilities right now, I cover hydro one. No one wanted to talk about the age of their poles <laughs> because at that time they were saying, oh, 50 years, 55 years. And, you know, majority of poles were well over that age. So the average age of the overall network was much higher. And we are seeing that they are standing longer. Capital allocation is going into other areas at the utility level. So it was just good to get that insight from you. So thank you. Um, I just want to see what we're doing for time. Okay, I'll ask one more and then we'll see. Is there any questions from the audience, Julian, as of yet? Nothing from the audience, but I just want to okay. reiterate that, like, if you don't want to ask your question out loud, you can always use the chat function and I will ask the question. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll just move into ESG. Um, you, you've seen probably the last two or three years, there's definitely greater interest in this area from the investment community. I'm just wondering if you could speak to, you know, the firm Stella Jones's overall approach to ESG. How has the strategy evolved? How do you expect it to evolve? We're still so early within the cycle. Um, and do you think some of these criteria that are um, picking up in importance. So whether it's safety or diversity or um, cybersecurity or governance, do you think, you know, it's, it's being discussed or at the, you know, at the le contract level or when you're talking to customers, they care at all about your ESG strategy or it's not even entering discussions at this point? It, 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 it is becoming more and more important. Um, uh, you know, we, we have customers, some customers inquiring about it, uh, Canadian utilities for, sh for sure are interested in it. And we actually point them to our ESG report. Um, so we ourselves are maybe at the, at the beginning of the, of the journey. So we, we produced the first report in 2018 with our 2017 data, um, skipped a year to regroup ourselves internally to better understand the framework and so on. And, and then in 2020 published uh, our second report, which is a bit more involved report that covered our 2018 and 2019 data. Now the plan is to publish every year. Um, I think customers do put a lot and shareholders or different stakeholders put a lot of value to it because it, it does give you an insight to our business, which is different than just the financials. Um, you know, so we've built our reporting based on four pillars, you know, the, the product stewardship, the, um, the employees, the governance, and you know, the, the environmental aspect. And when you look at the report, you know, you understand like how we go about procuring fiber and, you know, because we do have some, some forestry activities uh, and we try to do it in, in, in the most responsible fashion as possible. It gives us a chance uh, in the report to discuss the, the benefits of wood product as, you know, wood products sequester carbon uh, and it has, our products would have a better environmental footprint than substitute products, be it be steel or, uh, or concrete. Uh, and then you know, we can talk about our health and safety programs. We call it shields internally that, you know, uh, that help us monitor and track our health and safety performance, but also on the environmental front. So I, I think it, it's, it's, it's a great tool. Uh, our, um, uh, our environmental subcommittee at the board level uh, has had a, a mandate change or, or an addition to their mandate where we actually included ESG. So now the board uh, also has their representatives taking a look at what we're doing internally as far as ESG goes, because we have like a, a, an internal group for a committee to, to, to work towards it. So culturally, we're making headway to, to bring it into our decisions and how we manage our business. As you know, we're definitely thinking about sustainability and being you know, around for a long time, but being uh, you know, a great corporate citizen. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Um, I guess I'll just, Julian, do we have anything? Yeah, we just received a question in uh, the chat from the audience. Okay. okay. So the question is, considering that M&A opportunities have become rarer, 
Uh, do you consider levering up the balance sheet and do some buybacks or bump up the dividend? So great question. Um, it, during 2020, uh, we actually clarified our capital allocation uh, approach uh, to, to, to the shareholders and you can find it in, in, our, in our MDNA. So, so definitely, you know, reading that document, you'll understand that, um, you know, until we, we get a chance to execute on M&A, the plan is not to lever down nor to hoard the cash. So we have been in the last year uh, active on our NCIB program. We have increased the dividend also. We do indicate in our policy that we, we intend of maintaining our leverage between two and 2.5. Uh, thus, you know, the use of the NCIB uh, to, 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 to greater extent last year to be able to, to maintain the leverage up. Um, we want to be cautious in that approach because I, we want to keep some dry powder in, in our uh, uh, debt facilities to be able to uh, to execute on M&A because I, I do believe we will have some coming coming down the pipeline, you know, in, in the near future. But to to, to answer the, the 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 audience's question, we are very mindful about deploying our capital and ensuring that we return value to shareholders. And obviously, by clarifying our capital allocation position, hopefully, we've given a a bit of uh, understanding to, uh, to 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 the market. Okay, thank you for that, Eric. Sure. Um, we have three minutes left, so I'll ask one and then I'll turn it over to you if you have any final thoughts. Um, I'm just thinking about, you guys have continued to surprise us. Like, I feel like you're pulling rabbits out of the hat every year, <laughs> like there's something new, you know? So first, um, you know, residential was so big, then the polls now, you know, um, sorry, railway ties was so big, then the polls now residential, um, just even the acquisition size that you spoke about, the three to 400 million. What time frame is that over? That's not my question, but <laughs> you, if you could answer that as well. And if we're thinking about the composition of revenue and even EBITDA, is there any new verticals that could come into the mix, if not in the next one or two years, even in five, 10 years, if we're thinking about the next iteration or the next chapter for Stella Jones. So just wondering if you talk about, you know, the, the from a mixed perspective, whether you want to do it on a verticals or geographies or end markets. And if there's anything new, I mean, you talked a few times today about the continued innovation, um, you know, on the, on the Thai side, even on the wrapped utility poles. So where do we go with that? Yeah. So oh, the first question you had, there's the, the timeline for m a you know, it's always difficult to predict with the timing of families, but I, I'd like to think it's over the next, call it three to four years. Um, so, you know, when, when I think about to, to your other aspect of your question, where are we going to be, you know, five to 10 years, you know, I, I think first we want to maintain and grow our presence in our three core product categories and m and is part of it for sure. Uh, our CapEx investment is also key to be able to develop capacity uh, to, to address the fiber as we're thinking about, uh, you know, the, the pole product category increasing their volumes over time. So that, that remains key. And then to your point, I, you know, we are turning our minds to how can we leverage um, our, our customer base or our plant network uh, or even our, our procurement capabilities to, to you know, expand our, our industrial category to some extent or in, into um, adjacent uh, adjacent offerings to our customers, for example, that, that could be of interest and a good fit for Stella Jones, that, you know, fits a bit, you know, the niche approach that we've had of servicing our customers and trying to stay away from, from anything that would be too commodity driven, if you want. Um, but th th those are the lines of which, you know, we're, we're sort of thinking about our, our business. So I don't think we're necessarily, you know, done thinking through what we can do. We've got a, a very strong balance sheet. We've got a very talented team very proud of uh, the leaders we have in each product uh, product division, but there's a depth of knowledge within those industries and adjacent industries of those product categories that, you know, makes us think that we could probably be successful at certain other things. Perfect, that's great. Thank you so much. I'll leave you with final thoughts. Um, if you had any for the floor or audience, but um, it was a pleasure. Thank you for opening up the kimono. I always learn more. So I have like, <laughs> you always joke about my notes, but like, I'm going to go back and translate all this back to my master. Um, but I'll leave it with you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just, just maybe a few words. I mean, 2020 was a very uh, interesting year, uh, exciting in the end, for sure. Uh, you know, the company faced a lot of um, a lot of challenges, you know, be it COVID, 
being you know record number of weeks on emergency responses for fires and windstorms and procurement challenges and, and so on. I think we really demonstrated the resiliency of our business. Uh, it is the tagline of our annual report for 2020. It's proven resiliency and it, there's a good reason for that. I think the team at Stella Jones has demonstrated that. I'm very proud of them and very proud of what we've been able to accomplish that as a group in the, um, in the last year. Um, you know, we delivered record sales and record profitability last year. We're, we're guiding the market towards another successful year in, 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 20, uh, in 2022 or 2021, sorry. And, you know, really excited about what, what, what's ahead of us and looking forward to future discussions with, uh, with you know, audience and shareholders and any stakeholders for, for Stella Jones. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining us. It my, was a pleasure. pleasure. Um, excited to learn more and excited to be continuing to cover the story. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mona. Have a great rest of the afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. We're out. Okay.